Welcome everybody to the Talk on My School Chapters July Career of the Month webinar on the Entrepreneur Career. I'm sorry, I'm just doing the first uh, minute of the webinar um, from the plane, but Erin will be directing the rest of the webinar. My name is Mehmet and I'm the president of the Talk on My School Chapter. Today we're hosting three speakers, Mr. Burke Tush, Ms. Diane Bowes, and Mr. Phil Santa, who will share their personal expertise in the entrepreneur field and answer the audience questions. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Talk on Board, the Talk on Education and Outreach Committee, and the rest of THSC for making this possible. But without further ado, um, we'll begin the speaker introductions. When you're called on, please take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and your job. I'm going to hand it over to Aaron Okuju, the Vice President of Takao High School Chapter. And he'll do the speaker introduction and carry on the webinar. Aaron? Aaron, you don't look like you're on mute, but you are muted. Okay, sorry, can you guys hear me now? Hello. Okay, awesome. Hello. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, just said, thank you, Mehmet. Um, and so yeah, speakers, um, you guys can start your introductions, just introduce yourself and uh, your job, what it is that you guys do in your field. Um, whoever wants to start can go. I nominate Diane to get started. Mostly because I'm curious. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for the nomination, Burke. Um, <laughs> it is a pleasure to meet you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, shout out uh, to, to the team. Um, uh, and specifically to Elif Oker. Hi, Elif, for, uh, for suggesting me for this. Um, pleasure. I run the Venture Accelerator at University of Michigan's Office of Tech Transfer. And that's a whole mouthful, um, but that means that I support startups, very specifically scientific startups, startups that come out of the sciences, any sciences. So University of Michigan, very large research enterprise, 19 schools. And so when you think of startups, you think of technology startups, right? The next Facebook or what have you. But you also um, hopefully think about folks who come up with the next cancer drug or think of the next type of drone or battery material. And so I work very closely with scientists who invent cool things and help them get it into the world. I'm a medical scientist by training. And so I've been on the science side of that equation, but um, being a really good scientist doesn't always make you, or actually very rarely makes you a really good entrepreneur. And so left academic science by way of an MBA, went into innovation consulting for a number of years. And the way I, when I meet new people, I describe my role is I usually say I am landlord and mother hen to 20 startups and a resource to another 150. Um, and those are some of the active startups that have spun out of University of Michigan that come from hard technology, some of it IT, but lots of it from very different areas of science. And um, sci you know, um, startups need support, and I'm sure we'll dive into that in a little bit deeper throughout the discussion. I say support comes in three flavors. It comes in advice, talent, and money and the right amount of any three of those at the right time is part of the magic that helps entrepreneurs and startups thrive. And with that, I'm just going to, to throw it straight back to Burke. Burke, you're it. Well, well, well done. Thank you for that intro, Diane. Nice to meet you as well, actually. Um, I don't think we had an opportunity to meet before. Thanks, Eli, for, for um, connecting us to these folks that are on the line today. Thank, thank you for the team. It's a pleasure to share our story. Um, it's quite interesting actually hearing Diane's um, perspective because we are on the other side. Um, I'm trained as an engineer academically, electrical engineering and physics. And I got my MBA and then I worked for Boston Scientific for several years. And after that, I've been with startups. And this most recent startup I'm with that was actually spun out of WashU from their Office of Technology Management. And we have our own Diane <laughs> at, at WashU. Um, but I think uh, in terms of what my job is, it's evolved over the years like everyone else's evolves. But I would say uh, as an entrepreneurial 
focus took hold for my career for the last 15 years now in four companies, I've seen a lot of different things, um, successes, failures, uh, lots of lots of failures, lots of, lots of mistakes. Um, my job right now, I'm the CEO of, of Centiar, and we have an augmented reality holographic guidance system for cardiac surgery. We are world's first that's actually used clinically. We are still world's first and only solution that's commercially available. And our job is to survive. And I think that's the way I put it. My job has been to survive. And in that whole mess of survival, you thrive somehow. And you make things happen. You create world's first. You, for me, it's always been medical devices. So I, I get to do things that affect human life in a uh, very imperative way. And that has its own um, benefits, of course, um, but also own weight that you carry as you as you do what we do. Yes, I think in a nutshell, I would say I must, my job is to survive and make sure our company survives first. And second, is how how do we navigate every single complexity we see as a startup? I'm sure we're going to talk about this a lot more. Um, how do we navigate? How do we? I look at it as a soccer game. I'm a football fan. I'm Turkish, so a lot of Turks are. <laughs> um, how do we make sure somebody is there when the the ball is up in the air and it's in a scoring position? 90% of the time you're there and there's nothing, but you still have to be there. And that's my job to make sure people are where they need to be. Even if it's a company of four or 50, uh, that doesn't change. It's the same concept. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Phil, I think is last. Yes, pass the ball. I'll corner kick it over to Phil to head it in. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. And as a uh, father to a six-year-old aspiring uh, football or soccer player, I can appreciate the analogy. So good, <laughs> good to see everyone. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. Uh, um, appreciate it and uh, all the work that you guys are doing. Um, I, uh, I work for, or an, I guess, an entrepreneurial support organization called Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, we work very closely with Diane and our partners at the University of Michigan and others uh, to help try and do some similar kinds of things. I mean, basically what happened to probably 15 or more years ago, uh, Ann Arbor as a community decided that they needed to have a more robust entrepreneurial support um, ecosystem, if you will, that included things like the University of Michigan, which is pumping out all this great technology and science and intellectual property and uh, ensuring that those companies as they are spun out are going to be successful, uh, not only as they come out of the university, as Diane is working on, but also if they're just going to be able to have a startup in Ann Arbor in general. So uh, we work primarily, our, our entrepreneurial support work is within uh, startups that are within the city of Ann Arbor, but we have broader responsibility for the overall region and end up knowing a lot of folks that are doing startups in the state of Michigan more broadly. Uh, and I think if to describe the, the job, at least as it relates to sort of our work um, in particular with startups, uh, I think it is to serve as, uh, as connector uh, it's to serve as, uh, I, I think, Bill uh, Mayer, who's kind of one of our peers um, in the organization, he calls himself a venture catalyst. So how can you help catalyze other people to help do some of that work? Uh, sometimes it's a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a therapist in chief. Uh, and then other times it's a matter of um, simply doing and, and being an extra set of hands to help um, the, the startups kind of go through and, and uh, figure out where they want to go, where their next customer could be, how they want to address their market, uh, kind of all those big, big and small business questions that I'm sure that we can get into. So I'll I'll try and keep my uh, my remarks short, but um, great to be here. Hey everyone. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction from all three speakers. So let's just get into the first part of the webinar now uh, with pre-prepared questions. Um, each Tuckam High School chapter member is gonna ask a different question to you three entrepreneurs. Uh, and each speaker will take a turn to answer every question. We request that each answer be like about one minute in length so that we have enough time to get through everybody and every question. But without further ado, let's get into the first question asked by Mehmet Tashiolo. 
Hi, entrepreneurs. My question for you is, what factors in your life led you to pursue a successful career in the field of entrepreneurship? And do you have any role models that you look up to? All right, I feel like the team is going to nominate me again, so I'm just going to jump in unafraid. Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. <laughs> and, and Phil, I'm going to call on you next just to switch it up, just so you know. Um, you know, uh, this is a tricky question. I would say, um, first answer, my dad was a scientist for a long time, became a science administrator, um, and had a startup on the side. So the side hustle entrepreneurship may be in my blood. Um, but really, if I'm thinking role models besides that, because that gets old, I would point you to two really inspiring women. Um, one is Melinda Richter. She may not be on your radar, but she is. Um, she started J Labs. So she was at Johnson and Johnson and decided Johnson and Johnson needed to work more with startups. And the way to do that is to bring startups in house, coach them, and learn from them. And so Melinda Richter pretty much single handedly convinced her large organization to work more closely with startups to kickstart their innovation. The other person is far more recent. Her name is Arlen Hamilton. And uh, she started, and Phil is like, yeah, duh. And which is awesome in good way. So I, <laughs> and Arlen Hamilton uh, started Backstage Capital. And uh, she recently published an autobiography and I should have grabbed the book. I'll do that in a minute. Um, uh, to, to, to show you from like being homeless and sleeping in her car to being a venture capitalist investing in minority entrepreneurs. She has done an amazing journey. And so I highly recommend looking into both. Thank you, Elif, for uh, posting on Melinda Richter. I'll post a link uh, to Arlen Hamilton momentarily. Throwing it over to Phil. Uh, thanks, Diane. Um, I, I think if I, I kind of took this in terms of like role models that you would probably look up to. And, and maybe this is um, kind of going later into some of the questions in terms of uh, advice that we could have for, for the students that would be on here. And I think um, it's great to be able to have folks like Arlen and others that Diane had mentioned, because I think those are people that you can follow. And it's really easy to do that now. Like Arlen's on Twitter and she's a great follow. And it's really easy to kind of see what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis with some of these folks. Uh, the other piece that I would say in terms of like who I would uh, look up to or role models, I think are similar that you would want to have in your life. Like I, I, I've always tried to have the idea of having like a kitchen cabinet around yourself as a professional and you're, you're trying to do these things because then they can be inspiring to you. And then you can also actually ask them questions and almost treat it a little, as a little bit as a kind of a mentorship component. So uh, for me, I have folks that like my, uh, my father-in-law is one, but we won't go down that kind of component, but it's great to have sort of a family member that's close. Uh, and then there's a couple of people that I've had a chance and opportunity to work with in my career that have been really helpful that are probably are not well known to you all. But uh, one of them would be Mike Finney. He was actually the first CEO of, of Ann Arbor Spark. He's now running uh, an economic development organization in Miami. Uh, and he's just a great, uh, a great person and does some really inspiring things. And so it's great to be able to have someone like him in your backyard that you can actually email or call on or see when they're in town or you're in town or what have you. Um, so that would be someone that I would probably mention as well. Uh, as, and I, I guess that would be my overall point is to try and identify even now in your, where you're at in your own life right now, who are those going to be those folks that are going to be in your kitchen cabinet? And that's going to change over time. But who are those going to be those folks that you can call on? And here's the, the greatest thing is that people love to be called on to ask for help. Uh, so never be afraid as someone that is coming up in your career to be able to ask uh, someone for their advice or their help. That is a big, uh, that's something that people love to do. So I, I guess I would leave it as uh, maybe more of a point of advice than, than anything specific. I think Burke, you're up next. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Diane. Um, I think for me, the entrepreneurial journey isn't uh, isn't really something that I thought I would end up with as a kid. My dad was in the army, Turkish army for 30 years. He started as a high school kid in the army and my mom was a teacher. so. They didn't know anything about entrepreneurship. In fact, when I quit Boston Scientific to join a startup, they could not wrap their mind around why anyone would do that. Um, so it wasn't so much as I've seen it growing up, but I think what, what I've seen is this drive to first survive and, and then thrive afterwards. And I've seen that from my parents, I think, 
starting with my dad, he grew up in a very, very small town in the eastern border of Turkey, uh, right on the border of Armenia, in a very small town, they were cotton farmers. So his story is he's the only and the first kid that come out of that village to study anything, high school and beyond. And he's always, he's, he's always been somebody who found a way to get stuff done. And I think that's where I've learned there's, there's always a way if it is important enough to do. If you feel like it's important enough to, to undertake, there will be a way to get through whatever issue you're dealing with. And in the end, I think that's what drove me. Um, but also I had this innate need. I'm not sure where that comes from, but I feel like I should be able to make some change in the world. I don't know why, I don't know where that comes from, uh, but it is a drive and I'm very affected by it every day. And I think my role models are similarly people who have had these really big visions for what the world should look like in the next era. Some of them I've never had a chance to meet. Some of them I have. Um, it's a few people, you know, I don't believe in trying to be like one other person. I don't feel that's authentic. I just, I just see inspiration in several folks. One of them is Paul Buckman, who's a very well-known CEO um, over several couple decades now, lives in Minnesota where I live. I have a chance to meet him regularly. He actually joined our board at CENTR as a board member and advisor to me. As somebody I know, I look up to, he's a role model for me and a mentor. And I totally second Phil's point is these folks you want to learn from, they are excited to give their time if you're respectful with it. Because for them, it's, it's a part of their legacy. And it's important after you've been a CEO for 20 years, what else are you going to do? <laughs> Leaving something for the next generation is important for a lot of these folks that you would want to get advice from. But I do have other role models. Like I, I do actually um, really look up to Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. I think I, I read about what he does and how he's changed the culture at Microsoft. It's actually remarkable. It's someone I probably will never have a chance to meet. But you don't have to do that nowadays. You can follow these folks and learn how they think and how there's lots of papers and case studies were published about what's gone on at Microsoft. I don't want to be a Microsoft, but I do really appreciate the way he's turned up the place around. And a number of others, visionaries, uh, Steve Jobs was someone I was always interested in, or Elon Musk. Um, as I said, I, I get drawn to people who don't accept the rules as they are today and, and see a different future. Um, I guess that's kind of what drove me to the stuff we've done as in our startups. Hope that's helpful insight for those folks. I just don't think there should be rules um, on who you should follow and what's practical. If we're gonna create a better future, I think it's okay to think a little differently. Alrighty, uh, thank you speakers. Uh, I'm just gonna close out Mehmet's question, but um, so the next question comes from Ozan Wheeler from Huron High School. Uh, hello, I'm Ozan Wheeler and I'm from Huron High School. And my question to you guys is, what are the risks, benefits, and costs of starting a business? <laughs> Go Rats. I Go Rats. I nominate <laughs> Eric. <laughs> so wait a minute, Rat is the... A rat is the mascot? Yes, uh, river rats are the Huron mascot. River I'm a Huron yeah. alum, so I had to throw that out there. <laughs> I'm like, a rat, we, got, we can do better than a rat. <laughs> well, Barrick, that has a story. That was a, adopted as a sign of rebellion um, oh. back in the day when Huron started as a school in Ann Arbor because Pioneer was the original Ann Arbor High School, and they I referred see. to us as the rats by the river. So we made the rats our mascot. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. 
All right. Is Diane going first again? I nominated you because I could. <laughs> you <did. laughs> I like it. Yes. We've, we've given the reins to you. Risks and benefits. So I believe risk is a very personal thing. And it, it, it matters. I think risk is calculated based on what one values. So, and this is a very complex, um, to me, it's a very complex thing because I, as I said, I think it's very personal. So for me, I found the risk of not learning enough, as I stayed at a big company. So for me, not being an entrepreneur was a risk. And being an entrepreneur, I get to learn every day at an incredible rate. It's, it's impossible to compare it. Um, so for me, I guess, you know, at a ethereal level, risk is very personal. I don't find it very risky to be an entrepreneur. But practically speaking, when you jump from a large established company, you are worried about, am I going to make money for a while? Or how long is that going to be? Startups go through funding rounds. We do. Every startup I've been a part of has. And those are always nerve wracking. It's a lot of work and there's no guarantees in anything. So I suppose financial side is a risk. And for those people who aspire to be entrepreneurs, I, I heavily suggest that um, don't be frivolous so you have the luxury to take that risk. If, you're, if you don't have to depend on servicing your debts and your lifestyle, you have some freedoms, but you're driving a crappy car or perhaps living in a house that's not the greatest house of all time, it gives you freedom. Then you can go pursue these things and learn and invest in yourself. And that's the benefit. You get to learn. And to me, I feel like the learning aspect is the most important thing. The faster you learn, the more you learn, the more successful you're going to be in the long run. And learning is painful. Learning is always risky. There's no way to learn otherwise. My electronics teacher had told me that in an electricity and magnetism class 20 years ago when it was really, really hard. <laughs> and he said, learning is painful. And I always remember that. But that's the benefit to me. If you're in an entrepreneurial journey, you will learn. I'm not sure what sort of path creates that kind of learning opportunities. And with that, um, we'll let Diane go last. We'll go to Phil. Uh, thanks, Bert. I, I, yeah, I think that's a, a great way to encapsulate it. I mean, I, I think the, I mean, if you're just looking at the, the, the question you had asked, was on, I think it's, you know, what are the opportunity costs? It means that you can't be doing something else. Um, and I think it's just a matter of, of uh, it's really a decision point, right? To matter if, if you want to go into entrepreneurship and decide to do that, then, you know, you're probably going to have to put up with things that you won't be able to do, right? There's going to be other opportunities. And, and I think about it even, you know, if you, if, if from the decision as a peer group to decide if you're going to try and pursue that as an opportunity, there might be things that your friends were able to do that you won't be able to do yourself, right? So like Burke said, you're going to be giving up on some of the, the nice things. You might be giving up on the nice big seemingly big salary that might come from some of your other peers and you have to say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna forego that because i know that either there's gonna be benefits for me along the way or you know hopefully at the end of some journey if you have some uh, you know a decent exit then you'll be able to reap the rewards of all your work but uh it takes some uh some strength and some mental fortitude to probably kind of put up um beyond that and if it's something that you're willing to do and say okay i'm going to sacrifice in the short term for something in the longer term um, then I think that's, that's, you have to just be able to get, kind of know that going in. So that's probably all I would add. Diane, feel free. I want to double down on some of the things you said, but in the interest of time, I'll just say what, what both of them said was really, really good and encompasses very much of what I wanted to say. And perhaps to drill deeper on, on something that lies between what Berth and Phil said, um, find the right metrics, happiness, often lies in comparison. And so it's like, oh, you know, what type of car does the other guy drive? What type of house does the other guy live in? How much money does the other person make? And 
that may not be the right metric for you. Do I do interesting work? Am I changing the world? Um, am I working with cool people? Am I, do, am I excited about my work when I get up in the morning? Or do I think like, oh my God, I have to do this work again. So is it just paying my bills or am I doing something I'm excited about? So find the metrics that matter to you and do the work that comes with those metrics. And so for some people, it's money. Like, yeah, I have a bigger car and a bigger house than you. Yay, I'm bigger, better. What? <laughs> for some people, that's not it. And so with that then really comes, how do I look at myself? Not how do other people look at me? How do I look at myself? I think that is uh, an important thing when you're looking at those risks and benefits. Um, and then perhaps uh, as, a, as a last short point, the opportunity cost. Um, I, I wanna double down on something that Burke said earlier because he's had a career in big medical device and he's now in a medical device startup. And so being seen as one thing rather than another is an opportunity cost. You do this at the cost of doing the other. And what I wanna make sure I tell you is you get to change your mind. You get to do the one thing and realize three years later, you know what, now I wanna do another thing. You can do that. <laughs> and with that, I'll give it back for the next question. Uh, all right, thank you guys. Uh, next is uh, Eja Uyulur and she's from Wai Hai High School. Hi, um, my question is how important is leadership and communication skills in starting a business? And can you give an example of a situation where those skills are necessary as an entrepreneur? Itchy, do you wanna pick someone to answer the question first? You know, otherwise I boss people around, that's never nice. Please, um, please do. <laughs> Zach, you can go first. Okay, thanks, Edja. <clears throat> Um, communication important or leadership important in being an entrepreneur. Um, uh, communication, absolutely hands down, no questions about it. It's perhaps one of the most important things. Leadership, that's a little complicated because not every entrepreneur has to be a leader of their organization. <clears throat> like the company I'm with today was founded by two academics, a, a doctor and a professor, they don't lead the company per se, but they are heavily involved and they are one of the major reasons why we are successful in what we do. So it's a little of a complicated situation when it comes in terms of leadership. So I would say leadership is not necessary. What is necessary is self-awareness. You need to know whether you can lead or not, or perhaps you can lead, should you lead, or are you better serving the company that you started in a different role? Self-awareness probably tops my list if you're gonna be an entrepreneur. And you have to be brutal with yourself. Not everybody is good at everything and that's okay. And our society is unfortunately values so much of the, the three letters in front of the CEO, but I find that to be, um, yeah, see, it does have a big job, but there are very important people in the company that also have really important contributions when you're in a startup. So in terms of communication, um, for your example question, you know, we, we went through a really difficult time last year with COVID and startups, especially every single one of them I know of had struggled through it. Some of them have persevered, some of them have perished. We, we have, we're on the persevered bucket so we're very grateful for that. But during that time, communication has become probably the singular most important thing the companies were trying to figure out how, how to navigate this complex environment. You were raising money and spending money. You're running out of money. Some people were just about to close their financing and that fell through. It was hugely disruptive for the startup communities. And leaders or the people who founded this startup owe it to their employees to communicate, even if it's things that you don't know, or if it's bad news. And in our case, what I did is I went to our leadership and said, here are some options. One option is we cut our pay, management pay by 20% over the next 12 months. We maintain everyone else on the team and we get through it. 
here's other couple other options. And it took him about 35 seconds to say, all right, well, we're cutting our pay. And that was that in my case. And what I've realized once again, and this is not the first time, but it's just the most recent example. I think if you treat people with dignity, one, to transparently communicate what is happening, what information you have that's pertinent to their life. And finally, focusing on the mission. If you have folks that worry about the mission of your company, they're going to do the right thing. I 100% believe that. And we lived it. I mean, that day when I was proposing the pay cut for everyone on the management team, I was almost in tears when it was so fast. They're like, yes, of course, we're going to cut our pay. Let's carry on. What's next? Um, so that will forever live with me as an example of how important communication is. And perhaps in that instance, leadership too. I showed leadership to say, Here's, here are some options. We're going to act fast. Here's what we're going to do, even though we had money in the bank. And sometimes um, that being able to take some sort of command of where the, the ship needs to go is also super important. Hope the example is helpful. I'll hand it over to Diane. Thank you. Um, boy, uh, powerful story. Um, uh, exciting to take the question in a different uh, in a different direction. And um, what I often say to people is, um, the best products don't win. Um, and so it is the best execution. The reason why all of us here have pretty crappy products in our lives, why crappy products and services still exist, is because the best solution, the best technology, the best product doesn't win. And so if that is true, then the answer is the best execution wins. And what does execution look like? In part, it's communication. It's being able to explain to people why and how this thing is better than the next thing. And so very specifically, I have a startup that I am working with that has been around for over a decade. And a decade ago, and, and Phil knows this example, I won't name the company directly, but another company exited about a decade ago, Health Media. And so this company that I'm working with um, has always poo-pooed the other guys because our thing is better. Well, the other guy, exited 10 years ago and made money hand over fist and are doing great work since. You guys are still bootstrapping this thing and it may never go anywhere. And so, yes, maybe you have a better solution, but you're so full of yourself that you are being a snob and not getting it out into the world. And it may die quietly on the vine because you didn't seize the opportunities. So execution and part of that is communication, getting the word out there. And with that, I will throw it at Phil. Uh, great stuff, uh, Dan and Burke. I, I, I would just, I want to underscore something um, I think that, that Burke had raised in terms of, especially as you go through in terms of the, I, I think the value that, uh, that, that our society probably paces on, on CEOs and, and even broader than that on, um, on founders, I think in general. And it takes a lot of, uh, Burke used the phrase self-awareness. And I just want to underscore that point that at some point, either in your own career or in people that you're going to encounter, there will be someone that is not going to aspire to that next to that CEO level. And I think that should be validated and, and that should also be something that is, is recognized as well. There are startups certainly, and I'm, I can think of some that are, are in Ann Arbor where uh, they started out as the academic co-founders, uh, similar to, uh, to a lot of, I think, stories that go on. And at some point that founder even though they started a company, it might be their intellectual property. It's probably their baby of a, of a company. They are going to have to step away from that. Uh, and that can be a tough conversation or it can be a very self-aware conversation from the board, from other mentors, from other leaders in the, in the organization. Uh, and, and that's okay because at some, point, at some point, you have to be able to get out of your own way. I mean, I, I think regardless of whether it's a startup or some, or some larger organization, oftentimes the leaders that are in the organization are their own bottleneck. Uh, and you, one of the, the um, best things that I think you can try and learn for your career is figuring out, A, are you that bottleneck in your own organization and how can you get out of the way to make sure that you can try and grow? Or B, if you're not, how can you communicate that going back to the importance of communication so that you can either minimize that, that 
bottleneck or decide that it's not the right organization to be able to, to try and work in or, or with anymore and, and move on to something else. So those might feel like kind of broad, uh, I don't know, maybe they're, they're broad examples, but I just be on the lookout for those because I think at some point, as you guys all kind of advance in your careers, you're probably going to have to deal with some of that. But uh, yes, communication critical. Try and make sure that you are um, being very succinct in your emailing, for example, and in your other business communication. There's uh, uh, That's always a great skill to, to think about and work on. Thank you, speakers. Um, our next question is from Elida from Stevenson High School. Hello, speakers. Um, my question for y'all is, when building a business from scratch, successful entrepreneurs are often on the brink of failure, but are able to push through and stay determined. How does the concept of everlasting resilience in tough situations apply to you? And a quick reminder, so we stay in our time brink, if we could stay between like uh, one to two minutes of answering, that would be great. Who'd you pick, Elida? I'll pick. Uh, I'll pick Phil this time. I don't think he started first. Uh, great. I. I. All right. So I'll. I'll take. Mindful of the sixty seconds, and I appreciate you being timekeeper. That's often one of my roles. So I will. Uh, I'll be mindful, and I'll take now fifty seconds to try and answer. Um, I think the. Um, from my perspective, I. I and, and this is where I maybe have a little uh, of a different take, or maybe an unpopular opinion on it. At some point, it's important to know as an entrepreneur, I feel like entrepreneurs are often on this sort of dividing line between how do I stay resilient and work on what I think is true and accurate and is going to be this great product and we're going to be able to do this great organization versus saying this isn't what the market needs right now. I have to pivot and work towards something else. And so there's this constant sort of like thoughtfulness around how do I make sure that I'm being have that tenacity to go through and sort of like overcome all the barriers. Or how do you know when it's the, the time is right to say, listen, this isn't the right approach for the market. Something isn't like necessarily fitting here or working here. There's something else has to sort of be able to give. So I, 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 I think there's a matter of knowing uh, when's the right time to push and be able to overcome the barriers and knowing when is the right time to be able to sort of uh, move on. So I'll be mindful of that. Uh, Burke, I guess we'll go and I'll call on you next. Thanks. That's a very good point, Phil. Uh, and I think, um, for me, my experience over four startups, everyone almost ran out of money and none of them did. Um, so success is differentiated for those that persist. This is, this, this is the only way to make it from my experience. If you expect a rosy journey with, with no, um, no, no situation where you have to find a way out, then that won't be entrepreneurship, I think. And again, this is only from my experience and the people I have been around in entrepreneurial journeys. So I, I'm, I think the question has the answer in it. <laughs> um, I, my only example is for every company I've been with, Centiar, we, we were down to two weeks of payroll for Sunshine Heart, we cut a day off of our schedule before we listed in NASDAQ for three months. Um, in, in England, I had to close an office. We had an engineering office in Romania, 20 people. Um, so very, very tough decisions we, we had to, to go through at times. But I think to Phil's point to finish off with that, if your mission is important enough and if your customers need what you're doing, then, then you got to find a way. But I think that if is the most important thing. Do, do people need what you have? If they don't, then do everyone a favor and go do something else. But if they do, then you have to find a way to go through. You just you got to find a way to survive and make it to the next point. Diane, what do you think? Agreed. Um, and tying together some of the things that the other two just said, um, I'm going to say resilience speaks directly to mental health. And that is the mental health of an individual. An organization will only make it if the people in it make it. And so as a leader, you have to put your own uh, oxygen mask first. And so um, that means that you need to, to everything that everybody said, 
you need to believe in the cause, right? You really need to believe that what you're doing is right, focus, and then pay it forward because that will still help with your mental health. Things like this, we're showing up, it's part of paying it forward, help someone else, uh, it generates positive karma. So, you know, believe in the cause, focus, pay it forward. With that, back to you. Thank you so much speakers. And I'm gonna hand it over to Burak Arslan from Novi High School. Hi, um, so I wanted to ask you guys, uh, so entrepreneurs are responsible not only for themselves, but for a team of others in their companies. Um, how do you manage your employees in a fashion that's effective, but not overly bossy? Pick a person. Um, back, please start us. Thanks. Overly bossy. Um, I think the I think the key term here is empathy. I think if you can put yourself in the shoes of people that are working in your in the organization you've been put in charge of, you can start from there. Then it will color every decision, every conversation you have. Now I think second thing to weave into empathy is servitude. If you see yourself as the the servant leader of that organization. And what does that mean? That means your job is to make sure people can be successful. You create the environment. You have essentially every resource of the company at your disposal, disposal as, the, as the leader or as the CEO. So it's incumbent on you to figure out what do you need to do so the people you've brought on can do their job and can be mentally happy. I think Diane made such an important point. I can't emphasize that enough. We spend hours just so that we can be a team and be humans with each other, instead of constantly being the pressure cooker of have to deliver. We go do fun things, we eat lunch together. We, we try to be human first, and that's always paid me in dividends in our organizations. I think it's the most important thing entrepreneurs can do. Show empathy and use your, the powers that have been granted to you to serve your team. Um, I'll hand it over to Diane. Um, powerful words. Uh, I, I, I can only second that. And, and perhaps on the, on the more nitty gritty front, uh, I, I will say I have always very much respected leaders I've worked with who have trusted me, who have given me the possibility to figure out how to do it. And so paying trust forward, hire great people, obviously work with great people, but then not don't babysit them, put the problem in front of them and, and work with them to say, you're smart, figure it out. I'll catch you if you fall, come back if you can't figure it out. But, but so trust forward, I think is, is, is really important. And at times, especially with teams, ask, don't assume. So, uh, you know, is, are you doing okay rather than, well, you would come to me if you weren't okay. So I think uh, trust forward, ask, don't assume. And with that to Phil. Great points all around. I guess I would just, um, I, yeah, I think servant leadership, I think that is a really critical phase and something that you guys should really dig in and, and learn. And, and Alice posted a really good book there by Simon Sinek that I would also recommend. Uh, and I would, I, I guess uh, the part that I would um, underscore is that not everyone is, you have to realize when you're uh, trying to manage people effectively that not everyone has the same experiences, background, understanding, home life, everyone's experience is completely different and, and altered than your own. And beyond that, everyone's personality is different than your own. So I'll give you a really practical tip here. One of the things that has been really helpful uh, in organizations that I've been at that have tried to work effectively at this is just do a personality test for those that are on your team. I mean, there's tons of them that are out there. There's some that are probably better than others, but it's always been helpful as a leader and really for all of us working together in an organization to understand that people have different, different personality types. Um, so I'll give you an example, someone I work with uh, is a high questioner, uh, and I'm a little bit more of a high um, doer. So you can come into conflict really easily if you have someone that is constantly understanding around why, but I have to take a moment and say, listen, 
She just wants to understand a little bit more about what we're trying to do and really get, dig at the root cause before she's going to be most effective at trying to do whatever they, that we're trying to do. And as soon as you recognize that and understand that she's coming at it from a different perspective, the conflict really disappears. So I, I would just, you know, underscore the idea that we're all coming at it from different experiences and different personality types and different uh, levels of understanding. And, and that's something that we all need to recognize, whether or not you're in leadership or not. Phil, if I may add one thing, this is very near and dear to me. You guys on the phone, you're in high school today, and hopefully someday you're going to be leaders out in the marketplace, leading tens of hundreds of people, hopefully. Please be aware of the biases that are put on women and minorities that are at your charge. And people do this to each other because we're all biased. It's kind of silly to say we're not. Everybody has biases. But I've seen this so many times. And leaders have the responsibility to set the culture where that's not tolerated. Or at least we're aware of the bias and we work for that to be not effective. The bossy word has used a lot for women. The women get labeled as bossy or emotional. And I, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's doing a, a gross injustice, not just for the society, but for your company. Because women are actually not more emotional than men. In fact, for me, my experience has been my male employees come into my office swearing and yelling four times a week. I have never had that interaction with a female employee, not once. Have they cried in meetings? Yes, but far, far less often. So it's super important, I think, I think as you guys become leaders, please be aware of this. Don't tolerate it. It shouldn't be tolerated. It's not okay. It's not how it should be. A 50-year-old doesn't know better than you do how to treat women or minorities I was one, right? I'm a naturalized citizen. My team, 70% of people were not born in America, but yet we create products helpful for patients. So please um, stay strong on this issue. I, it's very important. That's how we're gonna move together as a society. All right, thank you all. That was really good. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to Daphne Divi from Seaholm uh, High School. Hi, I'm Daphne, and my question is, uh, many high schoolers, such as the ones in Takam High School chapter, are very interested in pursuing entrepreneurship in their futures. What's your biggest piece of advice for young prospective entrepreneurs? Can I just jump in and maybe start? And so, because uh, uh, I've got a couple pieces here that I, I, I think the, the biggest piece I can suggest for you now is that you can start your entrepreneurship careers right now. I mean, you're, at, you're actually, in terms of where you're at in your careers, you're at a, in a spot where you could, uh, you could start a company. I mean, it doesn't have to be, uh, I, I mean, I think what's great is that what Burke and Diana are working on are really on, like ex great, extremely important and inspiring things, but you don't have to work on the next big thing. You can just have a side hustle uh, that talks, uh, that is part of your entrepreneurship experience is going to teach you all those different skill sets. And in fact, you have the um, you have the safety net a lot of times right now that some people don't have in their later parts of their careers when they feel like they're uh, sort of maybe drugged down by other routes that they would have put in. Give it a shot now. Like go out there and try something and see if it is going to stick. And, and if not, find something else that's going to work towards it um, because there are huge skill sets that you can try and have. And, and one piece that I'll mention for that that I think is really effective is if you guys listen to podcasts or you like audio books like I do. Um, there's a guy named Chris Gillibo that has a side hustle school podcast that he has every day. Somebody else has a side hustle that is not their day job. It's something else that they do that it gathers them income. And there are great lessons that are included in there. So I'll, I'll just throw in there and start and I'll toss it to Diane to go. Yay. Um, I can only second that. And so I'll, I'll double down on it a little bit and then, and, uh, and, and then add something. Um, you could just start in your spare time, like repairing people's bicycles, mowing people's lawns. So entrepreneurship is not all high tech. And uh, when you're applying to college and I were to look at your application and it says start at a lawn care business, I would be interested in hearing how that went. Um, that doesn't mean you cannot long-term work in a medical device company or start a medical device company like Burke does, right? So, but start somewhere. So uh, absolutely what Phil said, 100%. Um, on, on the other hand, um, and those are not mutually exclusive, find something that interests you. 
the hardest thing is starting somewhere. And so building entrepreneurship experience is hard because like I could do all these things. Well, maybe you already know that, I don't know, drones are the thing for you. You wanna do something with drones. All right, find companies in your area that do stuff with drones. Contact someone there and say, hey, I really love drones. I'd love to learn more and see if I can be, be useful in some way. So some form of like figure out the thing that makes you tick and try and do some of that helping out, I think can be really exciting as well. And it's a differentiator because right now you're high school students, you look very undifferentiated on paper to some college application, to a startup, to a future employer. Whatever you can do to, to do something different that makes you look different from each other, makes you more interesting. And with that, Burke. I, I think Diane and Phil have said, um, such a, such a great set the stage so well. So the only thing I will add is now that you started something, uh, you took Phil and, and Diane's advice, totally agree, yes, do whatever, something. I was putting docks in, in lakes when I was in college. Um, I didn't know anything about it, but I found a way that was a thing I could do to make a bunch of money, so I did that. A tutored math, do something on the side. But I, once you're doing that, it's a messy process. Ask. Ask as many questions as you can of as many people. No one expects you to have the answers. In fact, asking questions will serve you for the rest of your life. Just ask. And I, I can't emphasize enough. I find it so silly. People agonize. How do we do this? I'm like, just ask. There's a million people know how to do this. Just ask. And don't underestimate how hard it becomes to ask, by the way. So you're going to have to actively think about it. Companies are born and, and they, they meet their death because their leaders are afraid to ask. I've seen this so many times. Once you start, you hit a problem, ask. You will find somebody that can help you. And no one will view you as someone who doesn't know what they're doing. They'll trust you with, with so much more responsibility because you're aware enough to know that you don't know and are resourceful enough to ask. Could I jump in on one thing here? Please. If you ask, build your network. Stay in touch with the people who help you and say thank you a lot. Write little yeah. notes give them updates on your progress, and whenever you can, pay that favor forward. It is such a good point, Elif. When, when somebody takes my time, and I will always give it, or if they don't follow up, I'm a little hurt. Because I, you know, I don't have infinite time. <laughs> so that's a very good point. Oh, thank you, and I'm gonna pass it back to Aaron. Uh, so thank you speakers for answering all of our questions. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time here. So if you guys have any like last closing remarks, something you want to leave us off to inspire us with, um, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Diane. Um, any closing remarks? I appreciate that. Um, so if there's one thing you've probably taken out of this discussion is don't be afraid of doing the wrong thing. Do something. And then every now and then reevaluate. <laughs> and then do another thing. Um, the, the time of our parents and grandparents where somebody has one job for their entire career is not of, of your generation. You likely have many jobs and you'll have many opportunities to reinvent yourselves. And so use those opportunities. Don't be afraid to fall on your face. Even if the thing that you tried, whatever the lawn care business you started fails miserably and you lost all the money you paid for that new lawnmower, that's fine because you learned something from it and the next business you run will be better. So don't be afraid to fail. Doing something is almost invariably better than nothing. And I can only double down on what Elif said. You are young, um, building that network, staying in touch. Uh, so many times someone I spoke last to 10 years ago is the person that helps me out tremendously. 
So stay in touch with your classmates, with us, with other people you meet on your journey um, and just go after it. And with that, I'll throw it to Phil. Uh, thanks, Diane. I, I, maybe I can just, I'll, I guess my final piece here and I'll give you another piece of tactical things that's really helpful for me, which is that you say, okay, we wanna stay in touch with someone and I'll often do this, people will reach out and they'll say, hey, you know a lot of folks in the area, um, you know, who might be hiring and I'll be able to share the resume with folks or whatever. But I'd like to be, hear about with those people as they're going through their journey and hear about who they're interviewing with, kind of how those processes are going. And I'll often say, just keep me in the loop on what's going on and I want them to kind of give me an update on some regular basis. The flip side of that is if you're in that position and you're trying to build that network and you're trying to make sure that you're engaging with someone, literally put it into your calendar like figure out there doesn't have to be like every week but like every quarter every six months say oh i want to touch i want to keep in touch with that person literally give yourself a calendar appointment so that you remind yourself in six months oh hey i wanted to make sure that i was updating diana what was going on with that thing and you kind of continue to have that and people pay attention it doesn't have to be a lot over the course of in fact it shouldn't be too much over the course of a short period of time but over the long term those various check-ins can help create a very strong relationship so I would just say, use your calendar effectively. Burke, you're up. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'm gonna try to not say what was said already, which I totally agree. For me, I think the, the angle I would like to add is be authentic. All of you have the same capacity as some of these folks that have changed the way we live today. They're just human too, and so are you. But don't try to be like someone else. I think serving your true desires and understanding them, accepting them. You know, I meet some folks, young folks that are, they're just torn. I wanna get promoted. I wanna be called a senior engineer, but I don't wanna say it out loud. And, and that's a torture, right? Don't torture yourself. If that matters to you, if status matters to you, then accept it. It's okay. It never mattered to me, but it might matter to you. And that's fine. You're going to be just fine if you're authentic. And the most important reason is if you ever decide to go on an entrepreneurial journey, it's hard. And you don't need any more inefficiencies or any more waste of your energy on unnecessary things. It's an unnecessary worry. You have that desire, accept it. That's okay. Just know that you have that desire. It can color your decision-making and keep that in mind as you make your calls. So be authentic, be yourself, and don't torture yourself with things that you don't like about yourself. That's okay. Um, nobody's perfect, right? None of these folks who've changed the way we live to this day, in fact, they're far from it. They're all, some of them are awful people, <laughs> you know? So. <laughs> Um, please be authentic. Please don't torture yourself. In this day and age for young, young kids, it's so hard. And I, I can't believe I'm saying kids. I, I don't feel that old. But when I look at what year people were born. I, it makes me feel really old. It's so hard right now. People are so hard on themselves, right? Everybody's trying to live up to some random definition of perfection. It's very silly. It's very silly. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't add up to anything. It's not an indication of anything. Kind, be kind to yourself, be authentic. That's when you'll be at your best. And I hope, um, I hope you try really hard for that. I think that's a super important ingredient. Thank you, panelists. One last time, a uh, little round of applause. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your day to come speak with us. And uh, if nobody else has any more questions, I think we could just end it off right here. Could I jump in real quick? Yeah, of course. Phil, Diane, Eric, thank you so much. I appreciate you jumping on this call and with participating with this group. Um, I just wanna share with the kids here. So I'm Turkish too. I came to the States when I was six months old and I grew up in Ann Arbor. I graduated from Huron and then I went to the University of Michigan. So let me tell you how I met these three wonderful people. I met Phil through a Huron alum named Amy Sell. And through Phil, I met the tech community in Ann Arbor and eventually met Diane. 
Barak found me as I started to mentor startups. And everything they just described was effectively my journey. And now, because we've connected over the years, I was able, when Mehmet asked me, who do you know that are entrepreneurs? Say, well, I know these three great people. And they came. So that's the formula, if there is one at all, is just get out there, shake hands, meet people, get to know people, put yourself out there. And we as Turkish Americans can do that very easily. And that's the other thing. While there are biases out there, there are biases against us, which I also grew up with, but they don't stop us. And Barak is a great example of that. And hopefully I, I can offer you some example too. Um, so just keep on, keep it on and you'll be fine. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Edith, for actually making this possible by bringing all three speakers to us. And I know um, your dad, Anna. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> so we'll go back some other ways. But you see, it's a small group of people. And all you need to mm -hmm. do is just continue to connect and grow. And Southeast Michigan is a great place to be able to do that. Good luck. Yeah, great way to end. Uh, yeah, thank gonna... you, guys. <laughs>